Okay. Yep. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you for meeting with me. Yep. Jamaica, Parish of Clarendon. Um, could you describe your childhood to me, in your early years? Well, really, I, I was born on a farm, you know, which was self-sufficient. Family had um, cattle, they grew bananas, coffee, which was the products that they sold and exported. And I left the country with my mom, who went to live in Kingston when I was about eight. And I lived in Kingston until I was 16. Mm -hmm. I joined the Royal Air Force. Sorry, to take you, just to take you back a little, you said you left the country. Yeah. Um, well, I said country, the, the farm in the country, um, to the city of um, K Kingston. How, how far is Kingston to where you were? Well, I, I'm not really familiar with miles in Jamaica, but okay. let's say 70 miles. Okay. Yeah, it would be probably about that 70, 80 miles. So that was the age of eight when you moved to... Yeah, Kingston, yeah. So can you describe your childhood up to eight with brothers and sisters? I mean, how many... No, I had, I had no, no other child in the family, you know. I'm the only child for my mom. Unfortunately, my father died when I was quite young. I didn't know him very well. My mom left the family home and went to Kingston, as I said, and I joined her. I can remember as a kid I had to walk, when I was in the country parts then, you know, mm -hmm. I had to walk all miles to school because they sent me to school at a very early age. Uh -huh. You know, my family was one who thought about bringing me up in the, well, <laughs> you know, and, and um, it was a good walk to and from school in those days. Anyway, as I said, when I went to live in Kingston, now my school wasn't very far away, you know, so. I more or less was say, well, brought up in Kingston. Right. Kingston. Well, as I say, when I was 16, mm -hmm. I volunteered for the Air Force. I should have been 18, really, mm -hmm. but king and country and all that, you know, young lads are. Mm -hmm. And eventually I got into the Air Force and came to England in 1944. So. You signed up for the Air Force in, when you were 16? Yeah, although the, I said I was 18. Right, so... Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. you know. And, and then how soon were you able to come to England? Well, I, I did about uh, six weeks training in Jamaica. Then I came over to England and the troop ship, you know, about uh, could be a thousand of us, I think. How did your mother feel about you signing Well, she wasn't you? very keen. As a 16-year-old? Yeah, but I had a family friend, or we had a family friend, who was a prominent citizen. And I, I had a letter signed by my mom, mm -hmm. through his influence, you know, mm -hmm. that I was of the age and so on. Okay, today it seems a lie, but yeah, that's how it was, you know. So and. Um, that's so how I eventually came in the Air Force. So as a 16-year-old, were yeah. you quite mature? Well, well, I think I was. Yeah, I, 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 I was brought up in a matured way. I mean, when I was on the farm, i go with the lad who look well. We had people who worked for us, you know. But this was something he was brought up to do. You row the horse or you see how the cow was milked and things like that. So. Even at a young age, I was quite matured. I had to do mature chores, like, you know, fetch water and mm -hmm. things like that, because we had no running water in them days, so... <laughs> I, I'm just thinking, because you were schooled at such an early, started schooling from such an early age, yeah. uh, when you came to 16 and you decided to join yeah. the Air Force, what, how did you feel about academic study at that stage? Well, at, in Jamaica, my young stage, or at that time in... In time then, all Jamaicans felt that their kids should be in an office or a lawyer or a doctor. Nobody ever talked about being a mechanic or an engineer. Or e so anyway, 
I was studying to be an accountant mm -hmm. because I had passed an exam to go to college, you know, like. Anyway, during that period, that's when I joined the Air Force. Coming to England in the Air Force changed my whole view on life, you know. I saw that things was different. Mm. The guy who swept the floor, his girlfriend worked in the office, which we could never find in, in, in Jamaica. We were influenced differently, that people of different class, you know. It wasn't so much color in Jamaica as class and money. You know, okay, everybody expect the fairer you are, the more money you have coming from the slavery days, you know. Well, I mean, I don't want to go into that, but England changed my whole view on life. So how did you travel from Kingston to Jamaica after your six weeks of training? What was it? Oh, we came on troop ship, you know. We, 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 were we went into camp, mm -hmm. did some training, mm -hmm. then um, we were kitted out, we took a boat from Jamaica. We stopped at New York, picked up a convoy. During the war, one ship didn't travel. Mm -hmm. I was in a convoy of about 80 ships mm -hmm. from New York mm -hmm. to Britain, which took quite a good while dodging the submarines and blah, blah, you know. I, um, we berthed at Greenock in Scotland. That's where you docked? Yeah. yeah. From there, we were transferred to um, so, a training camp. Just to remind me, what was the date? You said I think it was 14. I, I, I came to Britain in 1944. Right. 1944. And do you remember I can't date? remember the exact one. Somewhere around um, end of October, November. Mm -hmm. Because I can remember we were all looking forward to see what snow was like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and things like that. Very cold, but we coped. You know, we we were issued with long sleeve underwear and underpants down to your ankles and things, you know. So and you, that you were saying you docked in Scotland and then And then we were transferred to Filey in Yorkshire. Right. Which was a well uh, it was a Butlins holiday camp, but it was took over during the war as a training ground for troops. And there was a oh, three or four thousand men there, English, West Indian, you know, whoever they were, it's hard to think. And um, you were in your own divisions about, I think it was 28 to a squad, like, you know, and... Uh, so, what were your first impressions of this new land? Oh, well, um, the first thing we couldn't get over was the fog. We docked and we could see houses mm -hmm. and then when you looked again there was no houses we thought we had sailed but you know uh, we know we hadn't then we couldn't understand the chimneys I mean uh, it, this might seem silly today you know I mean I, I considered myself a well well uh, educated fella you, you understand yeah. and it seems curious today that guys said they got a lot of bakeries there and it look at the chimneys, you know. And uh, we never knew houses or chimneys. So back in Jamaica, houses, how, how do they differ? Well, we, we, we haven't got to make any fire, so we have no chimneys. Okay. You understand? Because there's no need for heat. We never thought that, um, you, you, you saw the, the, the snow and the um, films and so on, you know. Uh, and you must remember, films then aren't as explicit as they are today. And you thought, well, it's, it's a bit of a fun in snow, you know, it ain't that cold. We never thought that ice, water could be frozen to ice. Right. You know, yeah. because we, uh, there were some swimming pools, as I say, it was um, Butlins. Yeah, yeah. And we were fascinated to know how this water is going to freeze because some of the English lads told us, you know, that then it started about the end of November, every day it hailed. You know, the hail, every hail stones. Yeah, yeah. And we had to go out on the shooting range and things like that. Mm -hmm. But we coped, you know, and um, at the end of our training, the commander of the camp even congratulated us for surviving the winter like that. Mind you, there was one guy in our squad who died. He, um, 
He used to run out in the snow and say, oh, I want to get used to it, you know, a bit of a fun. And he contacted pneumonia. Then he was in hospital. Well, when we completed our training, we had to split up then. So many to this camp, so many that part of the country. I came to just outside Kidderminster, a place called Hartlebury. Yeah. That's why I'm associated in this area. We'll come to that. Anyway, he insisted that he had to come with us, like because he was designated to our squad, although he was in hospital. So they released him out of hospital. He came here and within a couple of weeks, he had to go to Bridge North. There was a hospital in Bridge North, Air Force camp with a hospital, because two, the two big hospitals then for the Air Force was Cosford, and, as I said, there was a hospital in Bridge North. He went to Bridge North and he died. I was one of his uh, fall bearers, you know, and things like that. So, how long had you known him since? I mean, he, is, he, is this chap someone who came with you from Jamaica? Yes, 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 yes. We he went through the training in your Yes, place, yes. So yeah. How long had you known him? In well, it would be about, well, he died sometime in January, I think, or February. So probably five, six months, you know, not longer than that anyway. And uh, So then you're, you're in this place, Hartlebury? Hartlebury. It was the largest maintenance unit in the Air Force. What a maintenance unit is, it stores parts for aircraft, anything to do with lorries, aircraft, things like that, ambulances, you know, everything that takes to you know, look after the aircraft or things like that. And there was 11 sites, which call them factories then, that makes up the unit. Do you, do you yeah. get what I mean? 11 sites? Yeah, different places, you know, that make up the unit of 25 MU. Right. One site might be all tires, mm -hmm. tires for aircraft, for gliders, for lorries, for tires that I could stand in them days and That's how <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, any tire you wanted for anything, whether it was a trolley to push, you know, that was there. Wings for aircraft, whole section of aircraft, things like that, because there used to be like a long trailer that we used to call a Queen Mary, I think. Mm -hmm. that used to transport wings and fuselages and all that all over the country. With that what so you were designated to work at different sites. Because I joined up to be a year gunner. Mm -hmm. But then as I said you don't realise what war was like as a young chap. What what did an air gunner mean? What did it entail? What did the work entail? Oh, well, I'm coming to that. Okay. Well, if you understand by then, they had more or less broken the back of the German Air Force, you know. So, men that was needed for certain jobs weren't needed for that anymore, you know, you would serve plus now. So, you were asked, would you like to choose another? So, I thought, well, I'll be a dispatch rider. A what, sir? Dispatch rider, yeah. taking, yeah, yeah. you know, I put in as well for a uh, air sea rescue. You, you understand? Because all these were different. But as time went by, you know, the Air Force itself dragged its feet because there were things we didn't really know. After a while, you start to realize that they didn't want you to do certain things. There was even an agreement signed by our government and ourselves that we shouldn't be transferred out of the country. When you say we, could, do you... We as West Indians, okay. you know. Because uh, now we understand that they did, some people didn't even think it appropriate that the blacks should fight against the whites. You understand, war was a gentleman agreement. <laughs> how, do you, 
how, how do you know this? I mean, if you can just clarify for me how you know this. Well, I mean, you, you see and hear certain things, and even today things are being published that you can draw references to in your own personal mind. Uh -huh. You know, what, what you might be attached to a unit. Uh, uh, you know, a bloke might be, say, on a bomber station. And after the war, he, that unit was transferred to Germany and he didn't go, you know, and things like that. Uh, yeah, so. Do you remember, or can you recall any cases, any incidences of direct discrimination? Well, experience? well, little things happened in the camp, you know, that uh, there was one incident in our camp where the canteen was broken into and um, cigarettes and stuff was stolen and we heard a rumour, it was only a rumour whether it was true or not, that they saw footprints and there was a remark that it's only black men who can walk barefooted. <laughs> <laughs> Whether this was true or not, I'm not, right. you know. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, there was about, oh, I think it's about 70 or 80 of us on this camp. So when you, you came in from the sites for dinner, yeah. and as the rumors spread among us, we decided that we, we ain't going back to work. Mm -hmm. Well, then this bloke says, you can't strike during the war. He'll shoot you as well. They can't shoot the lot of us. But we weren't this clarified. Anyway, some officer came from somewhere and gave a talk and say it's a misunderstanding and so on, you know. So but yeah, but the, as far as any personal discrimination, it would be hard to say, you know, I've never really gone through any. Most of my problems as a young man was with blokes about a girl or something like that, you know, but uh, as far as anything else, I, you know, people discriminate against you, but not the Air Force itself, as far as I'm concerned. I have not seen any, because the only time I've ever been in a charge, mm -hmm. I was prosecuted by my own officer, mm -hmm. a Jamaican officer, because he said we were letting the side down, because a lot of the English officers and that things we didn't have much cup. Mm -hmm. So we start to use it to our advantage. If you had a weekend leave and you wanted to go to town, you had to pay if you didn't have a train pass. And you only get them when you have like a week's leave or something like that. So jumped on the train and the conductor come. <laughs> So oh, they ain't got much sense. <laughs> Travelled yeah. for free. <laughs> well, yeah. well, when he came on onto the camp as our liaison officer, he said he's going to change all this because we were letting the side down, you know, and letting ourselves down, which we quite understood. Anyway, I happened to go before him once for losing an overall, and because I was getting my head down then, not going to work and all that, you know. Because <laughs> you do this in the in the army when you first go in, you'd volunteer. Then you find out, oh, I volunteer for this, and, yeah. And um, he put me on fourteen days confined to camp and washing dishes in the cookhouse and all that, which was something better. Could get an extra leg and things, yeah, like yeah. you know. But yeah. that was how it was. Earlier on, you said a lot of people discriminate. I don't think the army did in particular. Well, not for me personally. I didn't expect anything, you see. But, you know. but before that, you did say something along the lines of, um, you know, things came about later that the, the army didn't want you to work in secret. Well, in, 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 in the secrets that's coming out now, you know, the politicians who said, well, they didn't want um, black colonials to fight in the war, and then it went on that so was against it and so was it. I mean, you see these things now on the telly, yeah, yeah. you know. Uh, eventually, in any case, whoever agreed we came in the Air Force, then we heard that uh, we, we should not be transferred to theatres of war in Europe and so on, unlike the Americans who went from country to country, although 
the blacks and whites in the American army didn't mix. They didn't? No, no, no. That's one of the things that shook me and quite a few. I never knew that color bar was the way it was. You know, I mean, we hear about, oh, color bar in the south of, uh, you know, southern states of America, but I never really understood how it was. Mm -hmm. I thought if you had a white friend mm -hmm. in the southern states and he said, well, let's go in the bar and have a drink, it was all right. It's only when I came here now mm -hmm. and we'd been in town and at Starport, we're just outside um, our camp, the next little village of Seaside. The, we are Riverside Town, like What's Starport, Starport. There was a large American camp, which was like, they came over from America, did a bit of rest in there, and went to the war in Europe sort of thing, you know, mm -hmm. because at that time the invasion had started. Well, we'd go into town one week, and these guys would be like from the Northern States. White Americans? Yeah, yeah. Although we weren't brothers, we went in, have a drink in the bar, we were there, and, you know. You and who? The Americans were there, we... Uh, when you say we, who were you with? Jamaicans, okay. you know, West Indians. Yeah, yeah. Well, which was mainly Jamaicans. Yeah. All right. No problem. Next week, same thing. Man, it's getting dark around here. Yeah. Well, those who probably was there before says, oh no, them are Churchill's men. Mm -hmm. You see, we, we used to have a flash up Jamaica, and there's a part of New York, I think, yeah. that has an area called Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And some thought we were from Jamaica, New York. Right. You understand? Yeah, yeah. But we have never been used to be told you can't go there and you can't do that. And that's where the fighting starts. So, who was the one that said they're Churchill's men? Because someone identified that you were British. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah? Some American who knew that we weren't New colored Americans. American, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then there would be the colored young, great big fellows. I mean, I was only, a, yeah. as I said, a teenager. Yeah. And he says, oh man, we can't go in there. Because they were frightened. They were brought up to be frightened. And I've stood back, you know, and feel ever so sorry for these blocks. He says, man, I might go in on the same guy when I go back home. Lives in my town and you'd probably lynch him. And I felt ever so, you know, we guys used to feel ever so sorry for him. Because that's the culture they were brought up in. That's yeah. right, you know. Yeah, you they know. had they had two lorries outside the town hall on a Saturday night. Uh -huh. And if there was one white in a lorry, and there was one black standing there, he couldn't go. And they're going to the same camp, although they were segregated. But the, the both of them, they go in the same lorry. One lorry for the black, one for the white. Yeah. So how did this make you feel? I mean, I know you said you felt sorry oh, for well, we black <laughs> Americans, but how did this make you feel? Well, like well, <laughs> we, we felt it to us, you know, in our hearts for them. But I mean, it didn't really affect us because we, we, we did as we like. You know, in our camp, we we shared the same things with English blokes, and uh, after a while, we had one of our own cooks, like you know, who provide you know little things the way we'd like it, and we could go up, and we had what the English guys was having, and some, you know, but they weren't really allowed to have ours. But we had friends who, if they said we fancy that, we got them some. After the war was finished. The Jamaican government used to send us a pound of sugar a month, I think it was. And uh, if you had an English pal, you shared it with him and things like that, you know. We went out drinking with the English guys and... If so, a in, in a sense, you interacted and with the English... Oh, yes, 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 yes. On a social level? Oh, yeah, so yes, 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 yes. Okay. Because uh, you found that during the war, the youngs weren't very well liked. 
I mean, they had the money, they could brag, they had the girls, you know, and things like that. And some of the English guys were jealous of them and all that, you know. So it was like everybody against the youngs. <laughs> you understand? Yeah, yeah. yeah, if a fight broke out, we know we were backed up by the English guys as well. <laughs> you understand? Some places you go, like I used to go up to um, Yorkshire, or oh, what's the name of the town now? Oh. And there's quite a few Canadians up there. Well, they they like the Yanks as well, you know, because although they had money in the pocket as well, they didn't brag like the Yanks with the big cigars and whiskey and, you know, things like that. And um, when you were in the uniform, life was much different. You know, put it that way, compared to when I came back here after the war now. Right, so before we get on to that, mm. earlier on you, you said most of the experiences in your life where fights had broken out were to do with girls. Can, can you elaborate on that for me? Well, to be quite honest, associations with girls wasn't difficult. You know, you, you probably go to a dance and you ask a girl to dance and who at first was all shy, but we all could dance and in them days it was what they called jitterbugging, you know, and being we were near America, we had a lot of American influences, you know, in dress and dancing and all that. Where's this? In Jamaica. Jamaica. In Jamaica, we were, we were influenced a lot by the Americans, yeah. although it's a British colony. Yeah. You understand? We were brought up in the British way of education. learning, education, and so on. Yeah. But the dress and all that was always taken from the Americans, you know. And the dancing and the stars listening to the radio and so on, which wasn't a lot then in any case, you know. <laughs> but you would listen to the radio. There was no television then. And you heard about Bing Crosby. Frank Sinatra who was my idol then. Yeah. We used to listen up at nights to hear him and the Americans had a station called AFN, American Forces Network, you know, and you could hear all that of a night. So the influences was like that. Well, when it came to the girls at first, they were shy. Then, you know, you chat them up and eventually they'd go out with you. The parents would know, they didn't want the parents to know. There was the odd one who eventually I was invited to homes and all that, especially Christmas or something like that, you know. People were being kind when you were in uniform. What you know. sort of age did this start off at? Well, say I was just 17 then, you know, 18, you know, the girls was, yeah, they were just young girls like ourselves, you understand? Yeah. I mean, uh, I never go in for anything like prostitution or anything like that. You know, it was a different way of life sort of thing. I mean, the, the girls were frightened about having sex and all that, and no, it isn't right. And, but like everything else, it did happen occasionally. It isn't like it is today, but it did happen. You know, girls even got pregnant and so on. But. Uh, that's how it was, you know. But as I said, after the war, attitudes changed again. You understand? When you were out of uniform, when I came back here. Okay. Yeah. So you say came back here, came back here from where? Well, I, I, I went home after the war, okay. 1945. I was one of the first to volunteer to go back, although I was asked to extend my services. I was in the camp with a teacher of mine who gave me private lessons in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And they, they formed what they called, the, the Air Force formed what they called an AVT scheme. That means if a serviceman who is about to be released, English obviously, and he wanted some tuition before he got back into Civil Street, he could visit classes. Well, they made this teacher of mine, uh, looking up his record, mm -hmm. they made him a sergeant. Mm -hmm. And he came to me and he said, well, I can get you stripes as a corporal to assist me. I was only young as you know, and I said, nah, I want to go home. So I volunteered to go home because the first lot to go home was 
those who were ill or got injured or so on, you know, they made up the first batch. And the, the spaces that was left, if you volunteered and was accepted, you could go. And I volunteered to go, and I was like on the first lot to go back. Mm -hmm. So how long were you back for in Jamaica? Well, I went back home, and <coughs> I decided now to go back to school, because the opportunities open were like, men who lived out in the country or it doesn't matter where you are you you could be allocated some land if you wanted to go back to school you would be supported in that direction so i decided that i'd go back to technical college and take a course of welding why welding until today i can't really tell you why but as i said i had gotten away from the idea that i want to be in an office I have always thought to myself, a man works and he comes home with a bath and he changes into a suit, which was suits them days. You're a different person. Anyway, when I went back and I, my mother said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to take a course of welding at the technical college, you know, through the Air Force, because they set up a school for us at where the Jamaica University is now, you know. And she cried, thinking I had no ambition, wanted to be a welder. I mean, at that time, electric welding was a new process. You know, there were many electric welders. I'll get back to the, come to that later on anyway. So they crammed into one year's teaching what should be done in two. And we had our server, server tickets and that, uh, you know. So after that was finished now, a lot of the guys were coming back, the troops were coming, bringing the guys home, both from the Army and Air Force and so on. Brooks, who still signed on, came home for holidays. You know, some brought their wives with them. Because at that time, even if you never wanted to go back home, you could just stop in England. Mm -hmm. You see, that was how it was during the colonial days. If an Englishman came to Jamaica and wanted to stop, he just stopped. If I came to England and I wanted to stop, which a lot of the guys never go back home. But I went home and got them mobbed and went back to college. Anyway, one night a few of us said, let's go back to England, just for the fun of it. See how things were. When was this now in terms of days? This was 1948 now. Okay. And, um, we just got a passport. They said um, it was 28 pounds. Well, looking back on it now, what had happened was this. There was a factory starting up back in Britain, but the men to work in the factories, the shortage. But the British government uh, never said, we'll take you on, as, on a contractor and so on, you see. They just left it to your own devices. You understand? Mm -hmm. Well, the 28 pound, that I, as we saw, it was just to pay for your food on the ship getting back here. Anyway, we came back to England. And um, a friend of mine from who we were stationed together in the camp, he got married. He was an older man, you know. He got married and lived in Starbridge. So I wrote him to say, well, I'm coming back stop with you for a few days, which we thought that you could come and find a small hotel and yeah. have a room. Nothing like that. So when you said we... I mean, we, uh, people, Jamaicans, you know, when I say we, yeah. Jamaica. How my, many people came over with you? Uh, uh, oh, there were friends. quite a few okay. thousand who, I think there was about a thousand on the boat. Okay. You know, some guys who came home on holiday and they're coming back to the Air Force, other people who were just immigrating, you understand, owing to the fact that they know they could come to England. When we got to Bermuda, mm -hmm. at that time Bermuda, it's the first place I've ever seen a sign saying colored and white, mm -hmm. right? No, Bermuda is a British colony, or was, I don't know if it's independent now, I can't quite remember. But when we got to Bermuda, it was an American playground, see? Mm -hmm. 
you saying you can't do this? And we said, no, I said, this is British. <laughs> you understand? Well, they say Jamaicans are arrogant. But as I said, we have never been used to be pushed about. We might be poor and can't afford to go in there. But if you had your money, you're going to go in. You understand? And we caused such a stir in Bermuda that it was never been the same. Well, when we, we came off the ship, we had a pass. Mm -hmm. So any Bermuda and colored guy we met and he wanted to go in, then we just gave him the pass so we will feed you on the ship. <laughs> you understand? So the ship left Bermuda with, a, with about 500 more passengers than it went on with. <laughs> you understand? Because as, as long as they had a passport, yeah. when they came here, some got a few days in prison for stowing away and all that. but. They couldn't deport them, see, right. because... So, the next time I went to Bermuda, things was different. You could go anywhere and... Yeah, so we changed the whole history of Bermuda. <laughs> so when you came to... Where, where did the ship dock, that ship? Um, that journey in England? It was London. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of the docks now, but... We docked in London. Mm -hmm docks, some docks there, and some representative of the government came on because, uh, as I say now, this was something that seemed to overwhelm the government. And the only thing they did for us... Sorry, Karen. They issued, they issued you with a, a, a train ticket to go wherever you wanted to go. And there was an underground shelter in London somewhere, I forget the name of the place now, where blokes who didn't have anywhere to go could have gone there, you know, until they find their way around. Well, as I say, I knew where I was going. Yeah. And a friend who we, I, I knew him as a boy at home, like, you know, he said, I'm coming with you. And my other friend who we were like brothers, well he was in the Air Force with me as well. So we were both going to say and he came along. So three of us went together to this friend. And he put us up for a couple of days. He took me to you know where the Mary Hill Center is now? In Dudley. Yeah. Bradley. Well it's Bradley. Yeah. There used to be a steel works. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, by then I was a competent welder and uh, when he took a course of welder, he took burning, gas welding, electric welding. He used to drive a crane. He was the only colored man who works there. And he drove a crane. He got me a job as a burner. My other friends had a couple of jobs across the road in another factory, you know, but I work at the steelworks and uh, I worked there for, well, eventually we got some lodgings in Dudley and we moved from one lodging to the next. We were in a room with the four, four of us in this room and upstairs was some white guys, Irish and Scots fellas. But we all mixed together and went out drink well we didn't do a lot of drinking then as young guys. Mm -hmm. But in those days you had a bed. That was how it was. You know, you was expected to come in, eat, have a wash, you go out and you come back to bed. You didn't have a sitting room. So you said four people shared a room? Yeah. I mean four Jamaicans, like, okay. you know. I can't remember how the other fella came about. But by these different people start straining, you know, different fellas. As I say, I can only talk about the ones close to me in my group, like, you know. Anyway, uh, we were in those lodgings until we heard about hostels, mm -hmm. workingmen hostels, which were the Mayfield Flats, you know, the Mayfield Flats on the Willow Road. They're pulling them down now, but 
I have an idea. Yeah, right. down the way on our road was working with my men's hostel where you paid so much a week and you had your three meals. Now, the two meals during the week and three of uh, Sunday, like when you was up. And they made your beds, changed your sheets and so on, you know. It was like a hotel, but hostel it was called. So how many people shared in a room? Two, 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 two a room. It was just, uh, you know. And um, as I said, we heard about this. We also heard that uh, they wanted men on the buses. To work on the buses. Yeah. yeah. So three of us came over to the side to from, from from Dudley. Yeah. And we were told to go and see a Mr somebody, some major somebody. Just by the corner there was a pub called the Garrick, corner of Dudley Street and oh, I can't remember the name. Anyway went to see him and he, he put two guys down, um, no, before I go further, when we came in to Wolverhampton on the same day we met three other guys who came in from somewhere around Telford. I'm, I'm talking about color guys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that made about six of us, right? Six colored men. Okay. Anyway, he put two down in the hostel down there. There was also another hostel up uh, Merry Hill. Okay. Not, not the oh, Merry Hill. Hill. Yeah, Hill. yeah. Well, that was an uh, old, like, old army gun emplacement, what they used to shoot the aircrafts, German aircrafts, no one would say. And the billets were like for the soldiers who manned the guns. Right. Well, as I said, they put beds in it and used it as a hostel for working men, you know. Well, anyway, the Labour office recommended us to go to the, the bus company for a job, trolley buses then, there was only a couple of motor buses. Put your name down as a conductor and then you would eventually be a driver. So, I went for this test, and as I was telling a guy the other night, um, there was about 15 or 16 of us taking, but I was the only colored man in the group. So as I said, I'm just coming from college, you know, and questions was like if, if 10 fears had so much, you know. So I just looked at the paper, and so I was sitting there, and this English guy said to me, oh, Made it a long time out of school, you know. I said, oh, it's all right. And believe me, I did it for almost the whole room. <laughs> you, you understand? Uh -huh. Anyway. So it wasn't supervised by someone, the, the test? No, no, not really, you know. Anyway. Started out. Uh, funnily enough, the first bloke I went out with for training yeah. was an American. He married a girl from up Sesley. A black American? No, no, white, white, white yeah. And um, he decided to live in England, yeah. And uh, he, he, he gave me my first lessons on the bus, you know, collecting the fares and that. At that time, you had to wear a uniform, you, you kept straight and all that. They used to inspect you like you was in the army, you understand? Started out now. And you found some passengers wouldn't even put the money in your hand. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd put money in the seat and you were looked at as if you was something in the zoo. Because at that time a lot of people thought you had a tail and... What age are we talking about now? What year? I mean now, now it, this was 1949. Okay. So I was 21 then. So are we talking an age when there were very few black people visiting? Oh yes, so that, as I said, there was only about six or eight of us, yeah. the lot of black people that you'd see in Wolverhampton. Okay. You understand? Yeah, because yeah. there are certain days you said, Cherry, to your mate, you're going to work. 
And you don't see another black man till you come back home. That was how it was at first when I came here. Sure. You understand? Yeah. There was one old black fellow worked at the bats, cleaned the bats. Mm -hmm. I, I only ever saw him after I was here for a good while, but we heard about him. He was here from the 1914 war. Mm -hmm. you, you understand? Mm -hmm. So uh, that was how it was. You didn't talk to anybody unless somebody said hello, you know, and everybody. So Sorry, you were saying people didn't used to actually put money in your hand? Put some it some didn't. And they thought, some, you said something about they thought... Oh, they thought we had tail. tail, yes, yes. And this is genuine, you know, no, no, no you know. Genuine. And um, you'd be going along the street and somebody would stop and, you know. I can remember one day we were coming along, a couple of us was coming along the street. It wasn't like it is now, you yeah. know. And this woman turned, and I can remember her husband said, what are you looking at? You know what I mean? Whether he had traveled before or not, you know. And... So, you, did, did, did you ever get used to people staring at you then? Well, you had to. Yeah. You had to. You know, it was ever so difficult. Sometimes you used to just keep your head straight, just to avoid, even now, you know, I go on the bus and I don't see nobody. And they said, oh, Ra, are you, are you going to say hello, or, you know, because I met, I met a lot of English friends, because you had no alternative then, yeah. you know. You met English blokes in the pubs and so on. Some would speak to you, some won't. Some will start treating you as a friend, some won't, you know, but that's how you survived at first. You know, you took it as it come. I worked with a guy, he was my regular mate on the buses. Mm -hmm. We finished our stint, like, uh, you know, he used to do so many trips to wherever it is, and then you finish, like, a morning shift. Well, the conductor had to go and pay in at the office, took his cash in. So I took my cash in, we had just finished, you know, and as I came back out and walking into town, I saw this my driver coming along with the presumed his girlfriend or wife. I said, hey, Jim, and he didn't answer me at all. You know, I was ever so just because he was with this girl. Our wife, I don't know. She might not have known that or he didn't want her to know he was associating with me. And from that I took it upon myself to say, well, if I met an English guy in the street, he'll have to call to me first. You understand? Yeah. When saying that, I've met some real good friends, you know. I went on till, let's get it straight. It became a bit difficult with the living accommodation, you know. And I decided I was going to go to London. And I met this girl in a dance. This hostel down here used to have dances. The one in Maryham? Yeah, no, down the Willingall Road. Okay. Everything was there, like a cinema. Yeah. And we, they used to have dances twice a week, which was the only things then, you know. And um, we got a few girlfriends and blah, blah, you know. Well, as I said, I lived up Mary Hill. And my first big incident was that the secretary to the manager at Mary Hill started to date me. Mm -hmm. And she was, you know, ever so pretty and, well, you must remember there was about two or three hundred men. She was what, sorry? There was about two or three hundred men up there. Yeah. And this black man come and have this, you know, it when you say there were 200 or 300 men up there, they were mixed? Yeah, yeah. well, it, you know, the Poles, Irish, oh. English. Okay. And, the and there was about, to, at, by then now, there was about 10, 10 of us as colored men up there. Yeah, yeah, because the first guys here, the family and neighbors and whatnot, that the right to start it to come to England. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this girl was an English girl, yeah? Oh, yes, yeah. she came from Stoke. Well, she was a secretary to the manager. So there was one incident 
Jealousy started to rear its head now, you know, because there was quite a few after her, you know, and they couldn't understand how she go out with me, yeah. you know. So one night we came in and the, the watchman know that we came in to the camp, like, you know, or the hostel. You understand? Yeah, yeah. And there was an empty billet. She, the staff had their living quarters, and next to the staff quarters there was an empty billet. We were just popped in there, we weren't really doing anything, you know. It might have happened, but we weren't. Yeah. And this my, um, watchman broke in, and what are you doing here, you shouldn't be here. I says, well, it's just one of them things, but I says, well, in them days, According to the English, nobody had sex. So, you know, I said to him, I said, I, I hope you aren't going to report this because I don't want any reflection on Miss So and so, you know. He said, Oh, I've got to report it. Anyway, he did. So the next day I came from work. The manager called me to his office. Well, I was prepared for him, you know. He says, uh, where were you last night? So I said, you can't ask me where I was. I'm not a child, uh, you know. He says, you know what I mean. I said, well, probably I do, but that's not the way to go about it. You see, this is what caused a lot of people then not to like West Indian Jamaicans as such. Because they said we were arrogant. Because they expected that you, you, you should say, oh yes sir, I'm sorry, you know I said, I'm not worried about myself, but the reputation of Miss so-and-so, you know, we weren't doing anything, we just popped in there to have a talk. I know it probably not, it was wrong, but that's it. And you know, within a week they transferred her to another hostel up in Worcester. <laughs> just to break up the association. Yeah. Yeah. That but was the last of that? No, I still saw her after, you know, we used to meet occasionally. Didn't have a lot of money then to travel. But I went to our new hostel and spent the weekend, not with her, but at the hostel, you know, we went out together. And she had a boyfriend then who was a Polish guy and introduced us and we talked, we all went out for a drink and then she said to him, well, I'm having a night out with me. Nothing happened, but you know, what we used to meet, we used to go to tea dances in Birmingham and mm -hmm. because she was ever so nice, you know, know how to present herself, mm -hmm. you understand? Mm -hmm. Because I don't think she was, she was using me, but I have girls who have used me mm -hmm. in as much as they were ever so nice and they wanted to be seen. And being with a black guy, right. you know, they were seen. Mind you, I won't mind being seen because I, we, we, Jamaican guys, was always well dressed. They couldn't understand how we had four or five suits and, you know, because that was the only way we could keep our yeah. heads up, you know what I mean? Eh? And... So... Well, I, I'm, I met a local girl when she was just leaving school because I'm five years older than her and like everything else, she was just a girl on a, riding her bike around the park. I was playing cricket because as, as you know, every West Indian is expected to play cricket, you know. I wasn't particularly a cricket player, but being I was expected, I played and I became quite useful at the game. So we formed a team called the Normans, which comprised five West Indian and six English chaps because there wasn't enough West Indian around to. Where did this used to take place? Where? Uh, on the parks, and we entered the Express and Star Cup. Uh -huh. Well, <laughs> it was a big shock to everybody when we got to the finals. And we played the final against Wombun, 
which then women and even probably today could be in the Birmingham League because they had some of the best players around. But I think the only reason why they didn't get in or how we understood it, their ground couldn't accommodate the uh, Birmingham League side, you know. Anyway, we got to the finals of this knockout and we got beat anyway <laughs> because the occasion was more than a sort of thing. Well, as I said, I met my wife then and eventually I met her family, which was ever so nice to me, you know, treated me quite well. Because I, I never decided that I was going to marry an English girl and live in England. I never came back to live here. So, so in a sense, yeah. I suppose you would describe her parents as quite open-minded? Oh, yeah, yeah. They were with me anyway, especially her father. He was, when, when, I, when I married her, he was also proud of taking me around. He used to do work for different factories, you know. And like I was sat there, so on, he had us going and probably meet the managers. And, you know, by then I was driving past my driving test and all that. And um, he had a van that he traveled around with. He used to drive around with him. And he'd always introduced me as his son in law. And, and it, was, it, it was something to think about then, you know, because yeah. there a lot of people who would hide it that there was a colored in the family, you know. But they were, that was so nice. Also, her sister, Maria, friend of mine as well. And they had four kids. And her eldest daughter was the first colored girl. I'm sure I'm saying the right thing. That was born in Wolverhampton? No, to represent England as an athlete. Okay. Yeah. Okay. She, she, up to a few years ago, she represented England the most times as an athlete. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. Her name now is Elda, Verona Elda. But she was Verona Bernard before she got married. She managed the England team not long ago. And uh, I, I think she was given some honor at Audisley the other day. We were invited to go, but the wife and I couldn't make it. Well, in the early days, um, you know, we used to take the kids out to the seaside and all that because the wife and I, we were married nearly 15 years before I had my son. So we used to take the other, their kids out, you know, and everybody used to think they were mine, you know. Even today, people still say, oh, it's your daughter. Well, I don't know if you've ever heard of Roy Bernard. He owns nursing homes. Possibly. He lives up there in Well, she's married to him. No, no, no. He, this is a brother. Okay. Yeah, you know, he's a guy who's done well, you know. And um, he, the other brother, he is a fireman. And then the other sister, she married and lives in um, Nottingham. Well, as I said, I only have the one son. He's now 29. My wife and I have been married 43 years. And we found it a bit difficult at first getting a proper home to live in because at that time you had to be on the council 10 years before they would consider you. Anyway, we were lucky enough to we rented a flat after a lot of competition with other people and we lived on the Arsenfield Road. Then eventually we had a council flat at the Mayfields. That was about 1963. And I lived there until 1972 when the Powell was on about race and this and that. An English friend of mine at the pub I used to drink says, Roy, well, why don't you have a pub? Something I never thought about, you know. And then I started to think about it and I asked the landlord how you go about it. And he said, well, you apply to the breweries and so on. So 
I applied to the three bro main breweries, Ansel's, M and B and Banks's. Well, Ansel's was the first one to approach me. And the pub they showed me, I, you know, I don't know why I refused, but I did. And then MMB came to my home, and representative of MMB came to my home, gave me an interview. And I explained myself, he explained himself. Then he said to me, why don't you be a tenant? I didn't know what a tenant meant from a manager. Well, he explained that the tenant owned the pub. All he does is pay the rent and the business is his, you know. Told me how much it would cost and all. I said, no, nah, I can't afford it, you know, which I couldn't really. But they said to me, well, we let you have such and such a thing, some fixtures that I should have bought. And so I took over the pub. And it was a hard, hard, hard time. Why? Well, I couldn't get staff. The white staff didn't want to work for me. My own colored ladies didn't want to work for me. Mm -hmm. This is the early 70s now? Yes, yeah, 72 this yeah. was. The wife and I had to tie the lad in the chair. He's only one year old then. Mm -hmm. And do the mopping. I had was to do all the cellar work, stock the shelves. A couple of friends gave me a hand, you know, but I mean, they have their jobs and all that to do, which I really wanted to hire stuff. Eventually, I had a, a West Indian lady, I was even talking to her yesterday, mm -hmm. who decided to be a barmaid for me, and they were ever so good, you know, and we managed. But I had no time to say, well, think about improving the business as such as I wanted to do. But I had custom night and day, everybody knew Roy, both white, black Indians, Pakistani, everybody. I had no problem. Because as I said, I went into the pub to try and improve relations. And one night an English guy says to me, Roy, I really achieved what you wanted to do. You know, I had everybody come and drink with me. If you could just tell me the name of the, and the location of the pub as well. The first pub I had was the Three Crowns in with Marines. It's, it's now demolished. There are houses there now. Mm -hmm. It's the Three Crowns in with Marines. I was there for about five years. Then um, trade started to drop off because uh, the recession came. A lot of the guys lose their jobs and, you know. So I decided that I would move to a smaller place. And I went to keep the Swan Gardens in Oster Fields. That's demolished now as well. And I continued there till I was uh, 60. Mm -hmm. I asked the brewery to improve the building and they said, well, they, did, they weren't prepared to spend any more money on it. But I could have a choice of pubs anywhere. But I thought then I was 60, I thought it was a bit late to move again because at 65 I wanted to retire. So I, um, I came out of the pub trade and I retired. And that's... And that's where you are now? Yeah, that's what I am now. Can you tell me, what do you think, I mean, since you first came to this country, since you first came to Wolverhampton, how do you feel like it has changed? Oh yes, the trade how? changed tremendously. As far as I am concerned, Race relations was never better than it is today. Because when it boils down to this, it, it, it boils down to individuals. You, you understand? As for myself, I'm respected in the area in which I live, and whoever I meet. He, he, so my friends, most of my friends, the older ones, they have the respect of their community and so on. The younger chaps, you know, most of them have a different view of the country from us. I mean, I'm a British citizen, but I'm always a Jamaican. I can never feel, I couldn't say to an Englishman, well, you're not entitled to tell me to move. If you understand, I'm a Jamaican, I'm in his country. But the guy who was born here, I can understand how he feels. 
You understand? Because he's an Englishman, regardless of what anybody's saying. And the thing that I'm against, really, is for somebody to say to a black guy, you're a Jamaican, who was born here. You understand? He's not. My son is an Englishman, if you understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do. He and I are like brothers, if you understand. He, he is he an Englishman with um, a, a Jamaican ancestry, with Jamaican, you know, origins? It, it, is that acknowledged? Well, I'm a Jamaican. His uh -huh. mother is English. He knows all about my my lifestyle, and you know, yeah. he he's like me in every way. But uh -huh. he, as far as I'm concerned, he's an Englishman. Mm -hmm. I don't want him to start talk. Oh, yeah, go on, where yeah, go on, things like that. You understand? Because this is where he's going to make his life. And if he acts any differently, then he'll never get along. Mm -hmm. you, you understand? At the same time, he, if he meets, a, I mean, if you saw my son, you wouldn't realize he's colored. Okay. You understand? Yeah. But if he meets a girl, the first thing he says, well, I, I want you to know that I'm a half caste guy. You understand? And that's how it is. He's proud to stand up anyway and say, well, my father's a Jamaican. You, you, you understand what I mean? But I never want him to go out and start saying, well, he's this or he's that. He's an Englishman. And that's how I brought him up. Like I'm a Jamaican. You, you say, that's, that's, that's how I am. What do you see happening in the future? I mean, do you feel positive about the future? Oh, you yes, mean? yes. It can only change. I mean, when I first came here, I never envisaged a colored person on the television advertise something. Today you can't see a second program. I never envisaged a white guy marrying a black girl. In the last couple of days, I went to two mixed marriage weddings, and I'm only young guys who can have the pick of you know, but you can't expect two kids to go to school, sit together, and when they come out of school, they never see each other again. You understand? And as far as I'm concerned, in the next few years, there'll be more intermarriages and mixtures than ever before. The only thing that I'm afraid of is that the English might start to say, oh, it's going too fast, I did, but I see nothing but good to come out of this. So in your eyes, integration... Oh, is yes, it's, a, it, a it's, it's, it's a positive thing. Yeah, there's no stopping it, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I, I even see the Indians. Now, it's hard to say this, but we haven't got a lot in common, you know. I mean, I met a lot of Indian guys, and we, when I kept the pub, some Indians used to invite me home and all, you know, and to their home and have dinner and so on. But our way of life is so different. As men, we talk about women, you know, blah, blah, blah. But you might say something to an Indian guy, say, oh, your wife's got nice legs, and he'll be upset. You understand which? You know, you, 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 you go so far with your friendship and then you got to think. My doctor was a, well, my present doctor is an African, but my previous doctor, he's retired now. He might even have died or gone back to Ghana. We became good friends because when he came to Wolverhampton, he, there was nobody to show him any friendship. Mm -hmm. And he visited my wife who suffered with her back. And we got talking, I'm going back to 1964 or five, something like that. And um, he said his wife was uh, uh, in, back in Ghana for holidays. So we invited him to dinner. And um, we became friends. Went out together. When his wife returned, we used to go drinking together and so on. But even then, Although we were two colored men, I found that there were certain things that I could say to a West Indian, I couldn't say to a, a, an African as a joke, you know. For instance, I invited him to a party at the pub, and he told his wife, 
to tell me that uh, he wouldn't be coming. But she made an excuse to me, you know. So when I saw him, I said, oh, I'm sorry, blah, blah. He said, but I told her to tell you I wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. And he was so Stern. adamant that yeah. he went back home and had a row with her over it. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as I'm concerned, as a West Indian, it, you know, if, if, if another West Indian said that, it, there would be no problem. Culturally, I think. So culturally, we are all different. Cool. You see, and a, a lot of things that we take as an offence isn't really meant as offence. I worked uh, uh, at the factory for 17 years, mm -hmm. and this one guy is Irish. We were pals. He was the first guy to invite me into his home and we ate off the same plate, which as I say, it might seem a bit silly, but for that to happen them days was something that registered with you. Mm -hmm. Anywhere we went, because in those days you socialized with your workmates, you know, I mean, they're, apart from the few Jamaicans who there were nobody else to socialize with. And anywhere we went, we were together. You understand? And he said to me one day, well, I can't say this, and I'll tell you about this after. You know, but what he asked me, I could be offended. Okay. But I knew genuinely he didn't know any better because they were never taught anything at school about us. But I could tell you everything about England before I came to England. And I knew nothing about Jamaica. Even now, when I go back home on holiday and I see about our history and men who have fought for Jamaican to be independent and all, never knew anything about it. We weren't taught that at school. We were taught about Britain. Yeah. Leroy Haynes, I'd like to thank you there. Yeah, it's been a pleasure.